You're listening to the Voice of Russia in London. I'm Tom Spender, and we're talking about shale gas and fracking. The government has given the go-ahead for a firm to resume the controversial technique known as fracking or hydraulic fracturing to extract natural gas from shale rock in Lancashire. The company, Quadrilla, had suspended operations after its activity was thought to have caused two tremors near Blackpool. Fracking sees a mixture of water, sand and some chemicals pumped into a well under high pressure to force the gas from the rock. In the US, large-scale fracking has seen gas prices tumble by more than half and is credited with helping the country's economic recovery. Over here, Energy Secretary Ed Davey says shale gas is a promising new energy resource. But environmentalists say fracking can contaminate water supplies and cause air pollution. They warn that if the UK commits to power from fossil fuels, then it will miss its targets for reducing carbon dioxide emissions. So is fracking the future of British energy? With me in the studio to discuss this are Nick Greeley, an evangelist for shale gas who runs the No Hot Air website, Vanessa Vine, a campaigner for the protest group Britain and Ireland Frack Free, or BIF, and a resident of Balcombe Village in Sussex, where Quadrilla has a licence to frack, and Fiona Harvey, environment correspondent for The Guardian newspaper. And on the phone we have Tony Bosworth, who is an energy campaigner with Friends of the Earth. So, uh, is fracking for Britain? Nick Greeley, uh, perhaps we could start with you. Uh, well, certainly I think that fracking is the best news for the environment and for the economy. And uh, Britain uh, cannot uh, uh, stand alone uh, unaffected by the worldwide uh, shale gas revolution. Vanessa Vine. Fracking for shale gas and coal bay methane in the UK would be the worst news for the environment and the economy. To do it safely is a complete oxymoron. You cannot legislate for the vagaries of subterranean geology. We should be putting our investment into proper green renewable energy technologies that will be economically secure and will not cause the damage. If we take all the shale gas and the coal bed methane out of the UK, we might, quotes, keep the lights on for another 20 years and then where will we be? Fiona Harvey. I don't think the fracking is going to happen uh, on a wide scale uh, in the UK uh, for the simple reason that we're a very densely populated island. We have very strict planning laws uh, and it's impossible uh, at the moment to put up uh, you know, a wind turbine, a, uh, a, a waste recycling plant, uh, even a house uh, in many areas. Um, how on earth do you think that you're going to manage to dig wells that can cause earthquakes? I don't think it's going to happen. And uh, Tony Bosworth? I think fracking for Britain is, uh, is a gamble on a risk that we don't need to take. It's going to be bad news for local communities in the environment because of the risk of water contamination and air pollution. It's unlikely to lead to lower fuel bills for households in Britain, and it's going to keep us hooked on fossil fuels for decades, which is going to make it much more difficult to meet our climate change targets. OK, so Nick Greeley, quite a, quite a lot of uh, obstacles to overcome there if, if your shale gas revolution is going to happen here uh, in the UK. What, what do you make of the environmental concerns and, and, and the simple idea that it just won't happen because we can't uh, get planning permission? Oh, well, we do manage to get planning permission for uh, various things that are in the national interests and I wouldn't imagine that uh, shale would be that different. I think that one of the issues of many of the perceptions are that, uh, for example, we are too crowded. Um, the uh, shale gas uh, in the Quadrilla area of uh, Lancashire, for example, is extremely deep. Uh, it is over 6,300 feet deep. Uh, I could see that actually we could have uh, maybe as little as uh, 24 um, well pads, uh, they're called. That's about the size of a football field. Uh, there would only be perhaps three of those at once in an area of 1,200 square kilometers. And um, then uh, after a few months construction, then they would be replaced with structures uh, about the size of a shipping container. Uh, this is far less of an impact of people uh, consider. Vanessa Vine, um, what do you make of that? I find it laughable. The size of a shipping container. Uh, there are estimates of 800 wells in Lancashire. Um, if we are to produce 10% of our energy supply from shale gas, there's an estimate that we need 3,000 wells across the country. Nobody, Mr Greeley, is not talking about the condensate air pollution, the silicosis that is the risk to the workers, the fret field workers, let alone the local residents. If you start putting water at this pressure underground, at the pressure that will crack subterranean rock, 
you will damage your well casings. Two of Cadrilla's wells in Lancashire have already failed. They have proved to, proven themselves to be inept. They have been earth tremors. They're now saying they've got traffic lights, that when they go off, they will stop us causing earthquakes. Once you've triggered this stuff, it's such a human arrogance to say that you control it. The impact on the environment, the tanker traffic, the huge amount of water that will have to be shipped in to be used, to be, to be put down there, it will then come back as toxic frac effluent with all the carcinogens they've put in there, plus radioactive isotopes they've released that were previously safely down there. They've, currently, they've so far dumped it in the Manchester Ship Canal. Where is all this going to go? Nick, really, where, where is all this going to go? Well, again, we can look at the analogies of the United States, where we have over 36,000 shale gas wells drilled since uh, 2004, 2005. Um, there have been a huge amount of studies by uh, the Royal Society, uh, by the International Energy uh, Organization, by uh, the EU, and so on and so forth. And all these disastrous, catastrophist fantasies simply haven't existed. How dare you call them fantasists? There are people who are very ill. Their livestock is dying. Their pets' eyes are bleeding. I'm not being dramatic. You've seen the film, Nick. You know that this stuff... These people who've agreed to have this stuff done on their land in the States have signed non-disclosure orders. In the States, you own your mineral rights. It's a great incentive. Here, it's crown property. People are, du people are getting very sick. I think it's appalling that you say it's fantasist. Let's bring in Tony Bosworth. I, I know you want to say something. Talking about environmental fantasists, does he believe that the United Nations Environment Programme are environmental fantasists? A recent report that they produced on shale gas says that the history of, under of unconventional gas exploitation, such as shale gas, already includes instances of water contamination, leakages to soil, and negative health impacts. The United Nations Environment Programme are not environmental fantasists. Nick is, uh, as you said, he's an arch shale, industry, shale gas industry advocate. He supports the industry. And, you know, I, I think, you know, he would say that there is no environmental, there are no environmental problems. But, you know, the truth is that there are. But, I mean, uh, are, are these uh, environmental impacts something that could be improved over time? You know, the, the industry is at quite a, an early stage. If it were to be developed, then couldn't expertise be developed that would limit some of these um, negative uh, side effects? I think you can make the industry safer, certainly with tougher regulation, but you can't make it safe. And, you know, it's not just, the, it's not just people like uh, the environmentalists who are saying that. The MP, local MP for the area in Lancashire where Quadrilla are drilling, he's a Conservative MP. He says he believes that the regulatory system is not robust or transparent enough to, in, in, to inspire public confidence. And again, going back, to the, um, going back to the United Nations Environment Programme, they say that fracking may result in an unavoidable environmental impacts, even if it's done properly. So you can't make this process safe. You can make it safer, but the is always going to be the risk of local environmental impacts and they could be pretty devastating. But um, surely any energy production has an environmental impact one way or another? You, any, uh, all forms of energy do have an environmental impact. It's a question of whether we, of how much we want to gamble. We don't believe that you need, we need to be going down the route of shale gas and fracking. We don't need to be taking that gamble. Britain is blessed with huge amounts of resources, incredible resources for renewable power from wind, wave and solar. We can extract that, we can use that resource and we don't need to go down the route of shale gas. Fiona Harvey, what what are you hearing uh, from uh, you know sort of government uh, sources, as it were, about, about fracking? Is there great enthusiasm, or is there great scepticism, or what are people saying? Uh, I think there's a great divide. Uh, is the answer? Um, there is uh, great enthusiasm uh, for fracking. Uh, on the part of uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, George Osborne, uh, and many uh, in his party. Um, but there is a great wariness uh, among uh, the other two main parties, uh, Labour and uh, uh, the Lib Liberal Democrats. And that wariness uh, arises from some of the issues that we've just been hearing about. It also arises, though, um, because of the danger to our carbon targets. Now, the UK is committed... Uh, uh, on the international stage and by domestic legislation uh, to cut uh, carbon emissions by 80% by 2050. Now, that's quite a, a, a tall order, um, but it is doable. It's not doable um, if you start uh, digging uh, new hydrocarbons uh, out of the ground uh, to the extent that some people would like us to do. Um, in the US, uh, coal has been 
uh, the victim of shale gas. So uh, they're burning less coal now uh, and burning more uh, shale gas. Um, but in the UK, uh, there's a, a, a bit of a, a different uh, different landscape here. Um, we substituted a lot of uh, coal uh, for gas in the, in the uh, 1990s. So a lot of coal fire power stations were closed down and new gas fire power stations were built. At this point, if we start building uh, hordes of new gas-fired power stations, we won't be able to meet our carbon targets, and that's going to be a real problem. Nick, really, I'm sorry to sort of toss everything at you, but, um, (laughs) but, uh, you know, uh, carbon targets are important. Uh, Not really, not on a global (laughs) Not on a global basis. Surely, the, uh, well, surely that's please. exactly the basis that they are important on. I mean, the, the whole well, point well, of... Well, re- yes, exactly. They are important on a global basis. Now, I support the science behind uh, climate change, and I also think that the science is uh, similarly unimpeachable that uh, natural gas is the best solution that we can have. Now, uh, my friend and uh, fellow frackhead, uh, Dr. Dieter Helm of uh, Oxford... Uh, says that we do not have a climate crisis. We have a Chinese coal crisis. China emitted 5,000 megatons of CO2 due to coal uh, combustion last year, whereas here in the UK, our entire CO2 is 502. What we need to do is to move out and replace coal with natural gas on a global scale, and that is possible. That's a short-term solution, actually. Um, Gas can only ever be a transitional technology if we are serious about dealing with climate change because gas is still a fossil fuel. And fracked gas um, actually produces more carbon carbon emissions um, and methane uh, emissions uh, than other forms of conventional natural gas. You've got to take that into account too. How, How does the methane emission come about? Well, methane is natural gas, so it's the stuff that you're taking out of these rocks that you're blasting apart. Um, It's very difficult uh, when you're doing wide-scale fracking uh, to prevent uh, emissions of methane. Uh, The stuff leaks. It's gas. It leaks. It comes out of the ground, and you can't always control where it comes out and how it comes out. Um, So that's quite a serious problem. They call it fugitive emissions, Uh, and uh, some studies have suggested that the fugitive emissions of methane could actually mean that fracked gas is actually as high carbon as coal. What I've understood is that it gives it a higher footprint than coal. Schlumberger's own figures... Whose figures, sorry? Schlumberger say that 5% of gas wells leak immediately, 60% after 30 years, they all leak in the end. These, gals fa- these wells fail. Could it, two of Both Quadrilla's wells, drilled fracked wells, have failed already. The cement hasn't set. They've, they've gone ovoid in form. These emissions, as Fiona says, the fugitive emissions have come out. If, if we extract and burn 20%, just 20% of the reserves in Lancashire, it will constitute 15% of our global greenhouse gas budget. It is just absurd. All these figures about it being economically better do not take into account, as Fiona said, the fugitive emissions, the tanker traffic, all the waste. Once you put the environmental damage and the cost to human health and the cost of farmland, soil, air, water, all of it, into the equation, the economics change completely. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Tom Spender, and we're talking about shale gas and fracking. With me in the studio are Nick Greeley, an evangelist for shale gas who runs the No Hot Air website, Vanessa Vine, a campaigner for the protest group Britain and Ireland Frack Free, and Fiona Harvey, environment correspondent for The Guardian newspaper. On the phone, we have Tony Bosworth, an energy campaigner with Friends of the Earth. The EU recently pointed out that locally produced shale gas would have 8 to 9% less greenhouse gas than gas imported at a long distance by pipeline from Russia or Algeria. I say that we should have the gas here produced in our own country. Risks, we can learn from them. When something unfortunate happens, that doesn't mean that we are condemned to repeat it. Fiona Harvey, it is the case, isn't it, that if, if we all start producing our own, more of our own energy, that, that changes the kind of geopolitical map of the world, doesn't it? 
Uh, Absolutely. Ha- the, the geopolitical map of the world has already uh, changed enormously because of shale gas. Um, the International Energy Agency, who Nick was quoting uh, earlier, um, said uh, in a report just a few months ago that uh, the US uh, was going to be the biggest producer of oil uh, in the world, um, overtaking all the, the, the OPEC countries uh, by the end of this decade. Now, that, that's a huge change. Uh, and that is entirely coming from shale uh, oil, which, like shale gas, can be liberated from these dense rocks. Um, that makes a, a massive difference uh, around the world to uh, geopolitics, to power dynamics, uh, to economics, uh, and so on. We're already seeing the effects in America um, of the cheap price of gas, cheap energy, uh, which is making manufacturing much cheaper there uh, and making uh, the American manufacturers much more competitive on the world stage. Now, this is an issue that people have to deal with. Europe is going to have to deal with. Europe is going to have to find a source of cheap energy. Will this be shale gas? I, I'm sceptical uh, about it being shale gas because Europe is a very densely populated place and the areas uh, of Europe where there is most uh, shale gas uh, are going to be in, in Poland. It's probably going to, to come from there rather than the UK. Um, but Europe as a continent is reckoned to have much less shale gas than the US or China. And so even if we did exploit uh, the reserves that we do have to the max, we still uh, wouldn't be getting to such a competitive position as the US. What does that say to you? Well, it says that you have a future of trying to produce as much shale gas as you can in Europe. You know, perhaps that can be done, but you you will still be dependent on imports. Um, So the only way for Europe to actually become self-sufficient in energy is to invest heavily in renewables. Uh, Vanessa Vine, some people might accuse you uh, (laughs) of nimbyism. You know, you're, you're, you're there in your nice Sussex village and you don't want a big mine showing up. Yes, you can put to me the nimby argument and I will answer to that, that I'm a nomp, not on my planet. I was investigating shale gas, having heard about coal bed methane as well in Australia, before I even heard that this was going to happen four miles from me. Quadrilla site in Balcombe is 100 yards from the main London to Brighton railway line. I asked Mark Miller, the ex-CEO, what uh, magnitude of earth tremor it would take to crack a railway track. He didn't know. It's half a mile from the River Ouse. It's three quarters of a mile from the reservoir that feeds hundreds of thousands of homes through the water system. There's the Millennium Seed Bank two and a half miles away. It's a mile from the village. This technology is causing havoc in the States. Mr Greeley is being at best disingenuous in saying that there is... He used to say there was no evidence of contamination or earthquakes. Now he says there's some. There is considerable evidence. It is all coming out. Um, The Pennsylvania Clean Air and Water Alliance is publishing an ongoing list of the list of the harmed of the illnesses of people that that are happening there. I'm campaigning on this partly because I live four miles from it, I'm campaigning with just as much passion for Lancashire, for Scotland, for Air, for the Mendips, for Ireland, for the Karoo, as much as I can, because it is just a total lack of ecological ecological intelligence. Tell us about the the sort of global protest movement against uh, fracking. You know, where how is it developing? Is it very energetic? What's it like in the states? It's extremely energetic. It's exponential, and it's the most. Although we're up against this appalling juggernaut, it's an extremely heartwarming experience to experience the solidarity of all these people who are coming together and asking for help from other countries on the social media, just saying we have to get this information out there. The industry and the government appear to be, um, I'm not sure how much I can say, the information that we are being given officially, I do not believe a vast majority of it because of the research that I've been doing. Mr Greeley is paid by Quadrilla. He has worked for various governments in this industry. Are you paid by Quadrilla? Uh, Quadrilla is one of my clients, Uh, certainly, and I've always been very uh, open about that. That does not mean that I am their mouthpiece. Um, There's so much there. Let's, uh, Let's just go to the matter of earthquakes. Now, according to the United States Geological Survey, um, there are 14.3 million earthquakes between 1 and 3 in the Richter scale in the world every year. That means uh, during this program, I mean, who knows, it's 27 a second. Now, on this uh, viaduct, that is ridiculous. I mean, that tra- each train causes 3.2 uh, Richter scale, and that's been going on for over 150 years. Could you talk about the water contamination? Could you talk about where 
the frack fluid yes, to produce could water you tell, is going to go. Uh, yes, exactly. Tell me about the water contamination because the United States Environmental Protection uh, Administration, uh, uh, Lisa Jackson, the administrator, appointed by and working for Barack Obama, um, has said that there is not one single proven case of contamination that wasn't of water. my question. Where is the produced water and the frac fluid going to go? So far, Dart Energy has dumped in the Firth of Forth. Quadrilla, with Environment Agency permission, has dumped in the Manchester Ship Canal. In Australia and in America, this stuff is being illegally sprayed on roads as, quote, brine, as dust suppressant and um, de-icer. Where is it going to go? We do not have the provision to clean toxic radioactive frac effluent. Where is it going to go, Nick Greeley? I'm not really going to go into the detail because I don't know. <laughs> because, because the Environment Agency, I trust the Environment Agency. You appear not to. I trust the Department of Environment and Climate Change. They pulled you, the document the day we published it about the you, permission for the Manchester Ship Canal. You appear not to. And if that is the case, then let us do that. Certainly in Pennsylvania, for example, it is 100% recycled. Tony Bosworth, uh, can one trust the authorities on, on fracking? I think we, we, we have to be sceptical about whether or not we can trust the authorities. I think we don't know yet whether the regulations that they are going to produce are going to be adequate. We haven't even seen draft regulations from the Environment Agency or the Health and Safety Executive. It's far too early to say. If I can just come back to the point I was trying to make earlier about the impact on climate change, the International Energy Agency has said that if we go down the, the shale gas route internationally, we're going to lead to a world where we're going to have uh, temperatures going to rise by three and a half degrees over pre-industrial levels. That's the realms of catastrophic climate change. And the problem is that we're not going to be burned, as Nick, Nick thinks, we're going to be burning shale, using shale gas instead of coal. The problem is we're going to be using it as well as coal. That's what's happened in the US. The US is using more shale gas and less coal. They're exporting the coal. We're burning it over here in the UK. And until we have a global climate agreement, which limits the total amount of carbon emissions which we can produce worldwide, shale gas is going to be burnt as well as coal, not instead of coal. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Tom Spender, and we're talking about shale gas and fracking. Nick, really, I mean, surely this is the crux of the matter, isn't it? You know, we can't carry on heating the global climate because science tells us that that could make the world uninhabitable. One thing that I would agree with Tony on is that we need to have a new uh, a Kyoto 2, a new uh, global climate agreement uh, that is based upon the reality of abundant, uh, uh, ubiquitous uh, uh, natural gas all over the world. Uh, that was not the case uh, in the first uh, 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 Kyoto. Uh, we could have a carbon price. Uh, we can have all kind of things to, mar encourage, to encourage the replacement of coal with natural gas on a global scale. If that sounds crazy today, well, of course, shale gas sounded absolutely crazy only five years ago. Oh, Vanessa Vine says it sounds crazy today. Rightly. It sounds as if Nick is telling China what to do, because as Nick said earlier, you know, China is the world's biggest emitter and China relies very heavily on coal. There's a report out today from the International Energy Agency about coal saying that we're burning more coal uh, than ever and, and all around the world, even in areas uh, such as Europe that have controls uh, on emissions. So... What it looks like, if we start to exploit uh, shale gas to a very large extent in, in, in the UK or, or in Europe, it looks like we are telling China to do as we say, not as we do. Because once you dig fossil fuels out of the ground, you burn them. That's inevitable. And once you burn these fossil fuels, as Tony was saying, they are additional. They're, they're not really substitutes. They are additional. They're always additional. Um, and we just can't go on doing this. If we are to keep within two degrees of global warming, which scientists say is the limit, absolute limit of safety, beyond which global warming becomes catastrophic, climate change becomes irreversible, then we cannot burn all the fossil fuels that we have. And that includes shale gas as well as coal. Nick, really, surely, I mean, you talk about markets and this and that, but surely this is the point. You know, we have to wean ourselves off fossil fuels. No, we have to wean ourselves off coal. Now, in China's case, uh, China has even more natural gas resources uh, than North America. Uh, China is having an active program uh, to uh, replace coal. 
uh, not only for the environmental and health benefits and the fact that 5,000 Chinese miners die each year, uh, but they're also replacing it because they also have a coal import problem. So China, I think, uh, I certainly see a Kyoto too, actually, where the United States, Canada, Russia, Australia, all the people that uh, have gotten out of Kyoto 1, because remember, only 13% of the world uh, is covered by Kyoto 1, will actually do it. Nick, can you tell us why Rex Tillerson, the CEO of Exxon, four months ago in a private meeting said about shale gas, we are all losing our shirts today, we're making no money, it's all in the red. This is a temporary basis, and that is certainly oh, really? that, uh, that is also to do with the economics of uh, extraction in the United States. Uh, certainly, we are going to be having absolutely no trouble uh, here making a. How can you make such a sweeping assertion? We have a completely different model from the states uh, on every level, geologically, population-wise, environmentally. It's just absurd. There's no comparison. We have the geological gift in the United Kingdom, as uh, Deck will uh, be revealing very shortly, uh, that uh, puts uh, uh, us in one of the world's largest gas fields, certainly in the top ten. If we can extract it. How much is there is not the well, amount that we can course, extract. Of course. And what will be the result it's of that? my job. I'm going to have to call a halt to this uh, ping pong in the, in the studio. Uh, there because... is no community consent to this. That has to be said. The government is railroading over the top of what the people of the UK, who are intelligent, they clearly think we're extremely credulous and we're you not. You are confusing your opinion with the national opinion. Okay, I think I'm going to bring this to a close now. Um, uh, I'm going to ask each of our four guests to say a, a couple of final words. Uh, Vanessa Vine. If we take this route, we will be a lot worse off in 20 years. We will have contaminated watercourses. We will have poured billions of extra tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. We won't have invested in green jobs that will last, in sustainable energy technologies that will give us genuine energy security. This safe fracking is an oxymoron. You cannot regulate it. It's insanity. This is the wrong way forward. Fiona Harvey. It's true that gas can be a transitional fuel between uh, our current fossil fuels and renewable energy, but you have to consider that if you're putting all of this economic energy into extracting this gas, will people be willing to leave gas-fired power stations idle in, say, 10, 15, 20 years' time uh, when they haven't come to the end of their natural life in order to prevent the emissions that are causing climate change? I'm doubtful of that, and therefore it seems that renewables are a better option. Nick Greeley. Uh, hi. Uh, so certainly, I think that shale gas is inevitable. Uh, admittedly, it is my job to gee it up a bit. Uh, but we have to look at things on a global basis. What the United Kingdom does or does not do on carbon is absolutely irrelevant to the planet Earth, to our Mother Earth. Okay, the United Kingdom is a part of the world, and we can't just say, stop the world, I want to get off. Tony Bosworth. Going, uh, fracking is a risk we don't need to be taking. We should be basing our energy future on clean British energy, on renewables from wind, wave and solar power and on cutting energy waste. That's the right way to create jobs, to get us off the fossil fuel hook and to keep the lights on. Gap fracking is ri a risk we don't need to take. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, Nick Greeley, uh, an evangelist for shale gas who runs the No Hot Air website. Vanessa Vine, a campaigner for the protest group Britain and Ireland Frack Free. Fiona Harvey, environment correspondent for The Guardian newspaper. And Tony Bosworth, an energy campaigner for Friends of the Earth. Thank you all very much.